Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us on the second day of the uh, the CentOS Dojo at uh, Virtual FOSDEM 2022. Uh, kicking off the day for us today is Pat Rehickey talking about uh, tracking the kernel rate of change. Uh, and as a reminder, there is a Q&A tab in Hopin. If you want to ask any questions, that's the best place to do it so that Pat doesn't have to uh, try to follow the chat. So, uh, Pat, thank you for uh, presenting with us today. Always happy to be here. So this is my standard set of disclaimers. I'm not an official spokesperson for Fermi Research Alliance, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory at the US Department of Energy. There is no warranty. This is not an endorsement of any technology, software, service, or organization. This is just an act of research rather than a prediction of future practices. So depressingly, once again, I'm gonna read a lot of the slides to you. Um, I really can't come up with better ways to make sure that this is friendly to folks who don't speak English natively, and to make this slide deck really useful for people who want to review some of this information, extract it out, or do some slide karaoke, and just represent it. So a lot of what follows here is really just an attempt to ask the question, how do I get a kernel module that doesn't ship with CentOS Stream to work with CentOS Stream? What interfaces can I use? And how do I figure out what's changing and what resources exist? answer this, we're going to have to explore a lot of different parts of things, both in what this means in the kernel, what this means in the EL ecosystem, and what this means for your specific K-mods. So if we take a look at the official kernel documentation, uh, the Linux kernel driver interface in particular, uh, please realize that this thing describes the in-kernel interfaces, not the user space interfaces. Uh, Linux doesn't have a binary kernel interface, nor does it have a stable kernel interface. Kernel developers find bugs in the current interfaces, figure out better ways to do things. If they do that, the interface changes. They have to fix what's different, whether all the structures shrink or grow or move or new parameters happen. Now, the key piece of this is all the instances within the kernel get fixed. Whoever makes the change is responsible for making sure that change works across the kernel. Uh, releasing a binary driver for every different kernel of every different distribution is just a nightmare that no one can really get done without a significant amount of staffing. If you want a stable running driver, you only get that if your driver is in the main kernel tree. But if we move into the rel ecosystem here, uh, we've got uh, Red Hat's kernel application binary interface. Uh, this really tracks a set of in-kernel symbols used by drivers and other kernel modules for each major and minor release of the rel kernel. When a symbol has been introduced to the KABI, uh, for a particular major release, it won't be removed, nor will its meaning be changed during that major release. It can happen that uh, symbols on the KABI uh, stable list get changed. This is a sort of worst case scenario when there really is no other way to solve the problem. Red Hat generally endeavors to make sure that the changes on the non-stable uh, symbols are fairly minor and really only occur at, may, uh, at minor release updates but because these are not on the stable list, there's no guarantees here. When uh, non-stable list symbols change, this is not considered any kind of breakage. This is considered average development practices and part of keeping all of the new features from the kernel backported into the current kernel as part of their endeavor to make it the best user experience you can get. So the user space elements from the, uh, from the kernel should just work and not break. Uh, those are the guidelines from the mainline kernel inherited by RHEL. So if you're thinking about user space compatibility, there's a separate guide for this. I've also given a presentation on it that you can review. We're talking about just the kernel here. The RHEL kernel itself has a few stable symbols and a lot of mutable symbols. In general, I like the term mutable rather than non-stable just because the symbols change for cause, not at every compile and not constantly. Uh, for example, about 601 symbols, or approximately 2.9% of the whole kernel ABI interface, haven't changed in the RHEL 8.5 GA kernel since the RHEL 6.0 GA kernel. And only 81 of them are on the stable list. And if you remember, the stable list is not designed to cross major versions. So these are symbols that have been stable in the upstream kernel and while they are not officially on the stable list, there's been no reason to change them, so they haven't changed. 
So how really does the stream kernel relate to the rel kernel? At minor releases within the rel product lifecycle, the rel kernel is updated to match what's in the CentOS stream kernel since the last minor release. For a while after the publication, the two kernels are really in sync because the stream kernel represents the best ideas for what to do to make the kernel the best kernel it can be. And when it syncs up with the rel kernel, it's not as though suddenly the day after that, the kernel engineers come up with new and better ways of doing things. If they'd had those ideas earlier, they would have done them earlier, and they would have made it into the rel minor release. Eventually, the stream kernel does run ahead of the rel kernel, and then the rel kernel catches up. So what really is the CentOS stream kernel? Well, it's really analogous to the rel kernel plus delta. So what is delta? Here, delta is just really a placeholder for changes to the source code from the rel kernel today. And depending on a number of factors, delta will be zero sometimes. Uh, for example, when the rel 8.5 kernel released on November 9th, uh, the uh, 418.348 kernel had been in CentOS stream for 19 days. And until November 15, Delta remained zero. It went back to zero again on November 17 when the two distributions got into sync again. Then on December 21st, they fell out of sync only to be resynced again the next day. So really from November 9th to January 9th, the rel kernel and the stream kernel were in complete synchronization for 58 out of 61 days. Or to put it another way, for those 58 days, Delta was zero. There were no changes to the source between them. So, uh, the rel 84 kernel uh, was released on May 18th, 2021. On June 8th, 2021, the CentOS stream kernel gained a Delta that will persist until November 9th. Or putting this another way, on November 8th, the day before 8.5 was released, Delta was very much not zero. And it became not zero on June 8th in a way that stuck around until November. Uh, proving two things are not equal is really very different from being able to say how they diverged at a specific time, delta, or measuring how that difference is expressed, epsilon, or how that difference might impact your workloads. Uh, thankfully, we're working with source code rather than calculus, so we're nearly done with our epsilon delta proofs because we'd like to measure the instantaneous rate of change. Oh, well, nearly. Trying to define the CentOS stream kernel in a more formal or mathematical language, the limit of the rel kernel as time approaches end of full support is the CentOS stream kernel. Or for those of you who are less mathematically inclined, during full support, the rel kernel is at regular intervals trying to be the CentOS stream kernel. Each major and minor release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux has a set of in kernel symbols that they try to maintain. So the two match most closely at minor release updates, but there is an effort to try and keep them moving in the same direction. So great, how do I really understand these differences? What is epsilon, the expressed behavior change between say the 305 kernel and the 310 kernel? Well, how do you measure that? Is it lines changed, features added, function calls updated, bugs fixed, user experience alterations, something else? The patches we add to the kernel I'm calling delta. I care it exists, I care when it's not zero, and when epsilon is not zero. I care when the behavior changes. I don't necessarily care when the behavior doesn't change. If delta is not zero and epsilon is not zero, it doesn't seem to matter because nothing I experience is different. Uh, RHEL uses the mod version CRC checks stored in the RPM to expose the ABI that's honored by the stable list. So that's what I'm gonna to use to generate Delta. As for Epsilon, that's really about how your module interfaces with the kernel and your workflows. Mod version is not a great way to do this. Uh, to be clear, I do not know of a better way to do this. That's not the same as saying that tracking the CRC changes are providing a definitive picture of what's going on. In my experience, people care about how the changes impact them. For example, if you're not using the MP3, the MPT3 SAS driver, when that changes, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is also true if your card doesn't have the silicon that those changes are actually targeting. So counting the raw checks on the CRC changes is not workload specific and not necessarily behavior specific, and certainly not tracking your environment. 
These checks also can't perform any introspection. This is a good, if sad thing. To get the kind of interest, ah, introspection I'd want, the kernel would need to instrument itself, to instrument itself, to instrument itself, to instrument itself. I'm not actually clear when that recursive loop ends. There's also the mod info source version, which is super handy for mainline kernels and K patches. I'm going to ignore it here because that's not what's going on with the KABI list, but it's neat. And if you're curious, I'd encourage you to read up on it. So let's take a look at a case study here. Uh, OpenAFS, the 2632-279-EL6 kernel, ext4 on i686 systems. This is radically oversimplified to the point of almost being wrong, but this simplification is very clear about how the problem appears. RHEL64 backported a code change in the read dir cookies. As a result, the 64-bit inodes of ext4 are represented by 64-bit integers, as they always should have been. On your ic 86 32-bit system. Those of you who are familiar with these discrepancies will immediately go, oh. The OpenAFS KMOD uses a cache of inodes to manipulate the elements it's storing. This bypasses a bunch of pointless directory traversals and makes cache poisoning a lot harder. This is good for the safety, security, and stability of the cache. But when the AFS KMOD says, here's my known inodes, it's a 32-bit list of elements, and the kernel's looking for 64-bit elements, Things work a lot less well. The mod version checks didn't find this because the relevant codes didn't change. It, well, read there still returns destructive pointers. It still returns the same number of pointers in the same order. And they're pointers to memory addresses, so their sizes haven't changed. The value of what's pointed to changed. The checksums, by definition, can't, can't look at the value of the element of a pointer. They just look to see that the pointer is there. This is a really common pattern in the kernel because this is a zero copy operation. It says, I got what you wanted, it's over here, rather than copying it to a different structure, checking it for stability and sanity and for data leaks, and then returning it. We can just skip all that work and say, I got it, you can have it, it's over there. This can't be found by the mod version checks. Additionally, we've got feature flags. If we take a look at this kernel interface, copy file range. I want to highlight the flags parameter here. When new flags are added, does the CRC of the call and the return of this function change? Of course not. The whole point of the flags parameter is to avoid changing the signature of this function. This makes it really easy for developers to add a new behavior set and new features. Today, the uh, flags parameter only supports zero, but that's going to change once someone figures out what flags they need. This is not something we can detect by doing a CRC on this. Having a flags argument is a best practice in the kernel. This is something that makes it easier to develop interfaces. Uh, the copy file range is actually exposed to user space, so that is got additional layers of requirements on it. But if you're doing storage related or memory related kernel module stuff, Copy file range can help you bypass some annoying seek operations, so you might want to use it or functions like it that have a flags parameter. So what does all this really mean here? Well, the CRC differences will give us some sort of delta, but they can't find things like read their change. They can't find things like new flags. So this is really just some kind of minimum delta and no way to tell if it's a maximum delta in the end, it's just a defensible delta. This I can prove that these things are different somehow. But what you want is epsilon, the expressed differences. Is the 32-bit read dear cookie on ext4 on i686 a difference you care about or can see? How about input validation on an Ethernet or on an Intel Ethernet E810? Mount flags on an XFS file system? These are real-world delta examples that have occurred during the recent life cycles. But if they aren't expressed in your workflow, they're not relevant to your epsilon. So calculating the differences with this method doesn't mean nothing, but it isn't going to tell you what the differences you see with this kernel in your environment with your code are. So that's a lot of background for, so I'm going to make two lists of things and see what they look like. 
ultimately my methodology really here is pull down the core RPMs from CentOS Linux 8, the retired EL8 clone, and Stream 8, and compare them. This is exactly what I'm doing here. You're going to see snippets of it. Um, ultimately, the goal here really was to get you to the place where you understand clearly that code changes are not behavior changes. And some of the code changes are things we can't trace with this methodology, and we will never be able to trace with it. So here's the package that I pulled down for people who want to replicate my results. So if we take a look at the stable list, we see that there's uh, 725 lines between well, 8.4 and 8.5, and the top line of the file is just a header that describes the file. So we've got 724 stable symbols listed. If we look at the provided symbols from the 8.4 and the 8.5 kernel, we see we've got uh, 19,849 in the 84 kernel, 20,210 in the 85 kernel. And we've got 724 stable lists. So the stable symbols are right around 3.5% of the total kernel symbols available on the rel kernel on x86-64. So let's take a look at the 84 consistency. Uh, Red Hat has said that they try not to change symbols between, well, kernels that are within the minor release. And let's see what that data looks like. So we've got our stable list here in the green bar and our changed symbols in blue. And we see that with the 30531 kernel, there were no symbol changes. With the 71 kernel, there's 16, then it moves to 17, then it stays at 17, then it moves to 80, then to 81, then to 84. And this is the entire life cycle of the 8.4 kernel updates, which comes out to right around 0.4% of the kernel interface changes during the entire life cycle of 8.4. I'm just going to throw that there, and we're going to use that as an interesting factoid that we're not going to really track again because it's going to make the graphs way too complicated. We're just going to call that 0.4% some of my error bars. I have a lot of error bars. So let's take a look at the difference between the 8.4 kernel and the 8.5 kernel. And if we look at the symbols provided and their differences, we see here again in blue our symbols that are different. Our yellow bar here is our symbols that have stayed the same but are considered mutable. And then our green bar of stable symbols. And what we get from this data here is that right around 6,240-ish symbols change between the 8.4 kernel and the 8.5 kernel with the first kernel that came from 8.4 and the last kernel that came from 8.4. Two symbols that uh, were introduced in the last kernel from 8.4 made it into 8.5, but ultimately right around 31.5% of the total kernel interface changed. So let's take a look at stream against 8.4. And so we can see here that uh, the first stream kernel that we've got on the 8.4 side here has was released in RHEL and has no differences from what's actually in RHEL and no, diff no actual symbol differences from the 8.4 GA kernel. We get the 3.10 kernel here where we get uh, about 1,400 inter interface changes, which then moves up to about 2,700 then about 5,500, then 6,000, then it continues on up until we get to the 8.5 GA, which has that same number of different symbols that we saw before. So we can see that the line is trending up in terms of differences. Or we can look at this in reverse and watch the stream kernel become the 8.5 kernel, which is ultimately what the stream kernel is doing. And we can see here that we start off with a fair number of different symbols. It is a smaller number. If we look at our blue line here on the first column, 5,883 versus the blue line on our last column here, we see that there are quite a few symbols introduced in the 8.5 kernel that don't appear in the earlier kernel, and that accounts for some of our differences. These are new symbols and are therefore different than not existing in the old kernel. And so we can watch the trend line move down, where with the earlier kernels, we have 5,000 symbols or 5,800 symbols different. 
and it slowly trends down. We get some significant drops right around the 315 kernel, the 326 kernel, and the 331 kernel. What's most interesting here is probably the 338 kernel, which has fewer different symbols from the GA kernel than are on the stable list. That's interesting. It tells us a little bit about how the interfaces are stabilizing out and what is going on there. So what conclusions can we draw from this? Um, honestly, I don't know how to draw any real conclusions from this other than when the kernel changes, the kernel changes. Without an epsilon, without a use case, these numbers don't mean anything. There's 6,244 symbol changes between rel 84 and 85. Each one of those means something. Uh, glossing over them with a chart discards their value, what, what is being added by these changes, and their complexity. What do I have to do to adapt to them? And so I don't think that these numbers necessarily mean anything. We're looking at the KAVI because we want to build and load modules against it. So let's look at some of these actual KMODs in the wild. And those at least do something. They, they represent a use case. Even if they're not specific to a workflow, they at least are a thing that someone is building for a purpose. And that will give us something to measure. So let's uh, pull down some KMODs and track them with DNF repo closure. I've pulled down KMODs that appear to target the 8.5 kernel or are the latest available of that. The criteria here is a little less specific as I'm really looking for places where they break to try and identify why they broke and get some information from that breakage. So here's the packages I pulled down from KMOD SIG for people who want to replicate my results. Here's the packages I pulled from LREPO. Here's the packages I pulled from NVIDIA, OpenZFS, and Luster. Uh, for the record, I know the LREPO autodrivers exist. They're great. I love our friends at LREPO. I'm just looking for a variety of packaging and packagers. So the NVIDIA ones give us some differences in ideas. And here's some KMODs that I built locally. Uh, between when I made these slides and now, our friends at LREPO have built up the A3818 module but I didn't want to edit this slide and make it have only one element on it. So let's actually run these repo closures. We see with the 305 kernel, of the KMODs I pulled down that target the 8.5 kernel, the 8.4 kernel, 21 of them just install, and 41 of them don't. And that sticks around for a while, up until we get to the 326 kernel, where the trend line hard reverses, and now more of them install than don't install on 326 kernel. And then when we get to the 331 kernel in a much smaller list of them, and then the 338 kernel, only six. And then by the time we get to the 85 kernel, all the KMODs that target the 85 kernel install, no one should be surprised by that. So what can we learn from this chart? Well, 21 packages made it from 84 to 85 without any need for modification or rebuilding. And when the relevant kernel symbols change, they appear to stay with the new kernel configuration. So for example, kernel uh, API changed and kernel KML changes changed. They changed exactly one time and not again. The interesting one here really seems to be the 326 kernel, where a lot of the symbols these KMODs used moved from 8.4 compatibility to 8.5. Uh, of the ones that are left here, uh, USB IP has the most missing symbols at this point, uh, 12. All of them are USB related, which makes sense for a USB KMOD. Most of these are kernel drivers, or uh, kernel, they're all kernel drivers. Most of them are network card drivers, and so they complain when the network API changes for fairly obvious reasons. The NVIDIA packages are really bypassing the KABI and focusing on modularity streams. Uh, of the packages listed on the 338 kernel, the only ones actually listed there are the NVIDIA KMODs and the OpenAFS KMODs. And so while the 338 kernel lists six, eight, six packages that don't install, all six of those packages don't install because they are hard pinned at a kernel target, not at kernel module symbols. So we really get on the 331 kernel, all but two packages actually install. Uh, the largest oh, kernel impact really was the 326 kernel, 
and the 331 kernel. Of the symbols consumed, the KMOS themselves consume a total of 2,112 symbols, which is about 10% of the whole kernel interface. Uh, they're consuming uh, 566 uh, stable symbols of the 724, which again represents about 2.8% of the whole kernel interface. The change symbols here is the really interesting one. Of the symbols we're consuming that changed under us, it's 288 of those symbols, which represents about 1.4% of the whole kernel interface. And so this is really where we're getting a piece of the data we can use. What is the kernel rate of change that impacts me? Well, for these K-mods, it's about 1.4% of the kernel changes. And so that is our size of change. And we are consuming uh, 1,258 symbols off of the mutable list, which is about 6.2% of the whole kernel interface. So what can we learn from this? Well, the approach from NVIDIA is the closest one to what the upstream kernel itself recommends. Please don't step on the keyboard, Mr. Cat. It will confuse me. Uh, the upstream kernel recommends get your code into the tree so that you can target a specific kernel. NVIDIA is just targeting a specific kernel without uh, getting their code into the tree. With their existing setup, they can build against the stream kernel today without any, any impact to their existing users. They're doing the masking and modularity correctly. So they could start this today. Uh, does anyone know who we could talk to over there about getting this happening? I'm really looking for an introduction, not a email so-and-so. Because I'm going to send them an email saying, hey, I'm Pat. You don't know me. I'd love for you to do about a month's worth of work for me and then sign up to do about, uh, about an hour's worth of work every month. Peace out. Bye. I'm really looking for someone to have a conversation with to talk to them about the value here and how we can work together to get this in place. It's going to be a value to them because on the launch day of the kernel, they will have KMODs ready and available for their users. It will extend their reach into stream, which will give them more folks to test these things. And ultimately, it will give them a better place in this ecosystem. So the KABI users really had two big kernels that were important to them, which is the 326 kernel and the 331 kernel. The two most consumed uh, symbols within my test packages were KM, uh, malloc caches and an API enable. The network subsystem has the most consumed external symbols with the USB subsystem coming in second. I also checked these to see how much rebuilding is really required uh, between the 305, the 326, and the 331 kernels. I found only a couple packages that need to be built more than once. Uh, at 5 k required a total of three rebuilds, IV, QIB, required two, IW Legacy required three, Luster Client required two, Riser FS two, RTL8187 three, USB IP three, and WireGuard required three. The rest of them pretty much just recompiled without any real work. You just took the source RPM, threw it against the wall, and it built. But let's look a little closer at OpenAFS and NVIDIA. Uh, if we take a look at OpenAFS a bit more closely, the only symbol on the public list that changes is KMALloc caches. But we've already seen in our case study that OpenAFS can get caught by things we can't really introspect. So I don't know what to make of the value of this data. One symbol changed. Cool. But we've seen how these symbols can not change and still break things. If we take the NVIDIA modules apart, they're really interested in symbols that change in the 326 kernel. The major bits there really are around the DRM subsystem, which is not a surprise when the direct rendering system changes for a graphics rendering card. And once again, the kernel cam oh, malloc cache symbol changed. They care a lot about that because they're allocating a bunch of kernel memory. So what can I really conclude from this data? Well, we need a clear, well-documented place for a tool to listen for new kernel package builds. I'm hopeful that when this exists, it can be added to the KMOD SID documentation or to the build system documentation. But I believe that this is really caught up with the GitForge migration and what to do about fed message with relationship to that. Uh, so for the time being, you can run automated repo closures and the, that will pick up the obvious CRC changes, which gives you again some kind of delta, but not epsilon. 
only three modules really had our worst case here uh, of the 62 I tested. They required three rebuilds over the entire life cycle upstream between 8.4 and 8.5. This is 175 days for a total of three rebuilds. Over that same period, 288 symbols, which is approximately 0.02% of the whole kernel interface, is relevant to these K-mods changed, whereas uh, 6,244 symbols, or about 31.5% of the whole kernel interface, changed during that cycle. So the symbols that change that are relevant to these K-mods is a much smaller fraction of what's changing. I'm deliberately not quantifying how much work is required here. In some cases, you just recompile the code and it works. No work required. In other cases, you're going to need some development effort to look at what's changed. Uh, thankfully, none of this effort is really stream only. When the symbols change, they stay changed through up until 8.5. And these changes are coming from the mainline kernel. Uh, the Red Hat engineers are not inventing new interfaces that they're throwing in there and saying that this is Linux. They're taking it from mainline. So if you're already doing development work to get your modules running against the mainline kernel, you're already doing the work to run against stream. It's just a matter of putting the appropriate if defs in place. Uh, this work was produced uh, by Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, operated under this contract with the relevant disclaimers and disclosures. And so with that, I am open to some questions. So does anyone have a question or two? We haven't had any questions in the Q&A tab yet, but uh, it does look like you've had some volunteers in the chat, so. Success. Excellent. Yes, I. Uh, my email address is rehecky at fnal.gov. Email me. Let's talk. I will. Yes, please. I would love to chat about what this looks like and how to make some of these things happen. So I know that that was a lot of heavy technical data. Um, that tends to result in a bit of overload, but really wanted to have reproducible data in there. So if you don't believe me, you can prove it. Um, go replicate my results. I, I work at a science lab. Please pr prove or disprove my conclusions. That's what we do here. All right. Thanks, Pat. Uh, no questions. Then we'll uh, close it out and uh... The next session will be in 25 minutes. We can all take a, a, a break. Uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, there was a lot of you know data to look at. Um, and Pat did send me his slides. So we'll have that up um, available on the wiki later today if you want to um, dig into the data a little bit more without you know scrubbing through the video. So um, feel free to hang out in the, in the hallway track. Um, and we'll see everybody here uh, for the next session in about 25 minutes. So thank you, Pat. Take care.